So as promised, we're going to look at uh, choosing your competition. Uh, this is a segment we've been actually working on for almost two decades now, so it's quite well established. Um, there are a number of readings uh, that you can look at uh, that give you different flavor of it. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, you'll notice very importantly that choosing your competition will frame a lot of how we think about strategies and related to things you've heard about in entrepreneurial strategies, such as the lean startup, disruption, intellectual property, and so forth. Uh, but we'll come back to that at a later time. Uh, but of course, you can read ahead whenever you want. So competition has two choices. When do you compete? And who do you compete with? Uh, so it's a, a multi-dimensional choice. Obviously, there are lots of different nuances to it, but these seem to encapsulate a lot of what it's about. Take uh, as an example to see how this works, uh, keyboards. Uh, this is a picture of an ancient keyboard. Uh, you'll notice it is actually, uh, like a lot of things, uh, quite familiar as a user interface. Uh, you would at least be able to uh, work out how to uh, write stuff on this, uh, if you could work out how to actually load some paper and also how to, uh, you know, use a return carriage, which is this little thing up the top here. But anyway, that's beside the point. Keyboards are kind of interesting because uh, with mobile devices and smartphones in particular, there's been a lot of innovation in that space and uh, it is quite fascinating to see what is going on. There are a number of firms who had the idea at the same time of uh, making a better keyboard for smartphones. Uh, and there have been a number of innovations on that front. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, we have a firm called Tactus Technology. And you can see what they were up to here. Uh, they were trying to have a tactile user interface that combines the elegance of a touchscreen with the physical sensation of typing so that you can actually feel when you press a key. Uh, uh, the Blackberry enthusiasts out there will uh, note that that is one of the things that was claimed to be missing when uh, Blackberries, um, uh, when you're substituting Blackberries for iOS or Android devices. So Tactus uh, trying to actually implement that uh, for touchscreens. Uh, we also have SwiftKey. SwiftKey here, actually this is a earlier demo of one. Uh, uh, on a, uh, a Samsung phone that is um, simulated, so no one has to worry. Uh, the SwiftKey, uh, they developed this very powerful predictive algorithm that dynamically updates keyboards on a stroke-by-stroke -stroke basis. So you can see how that is working there. Uh, but basically, uh, it is using, uh, and we all love this, AI, to predict what people are trying to type to make them be able to type quicker with uh, fewer presses. Now, a lot of the keyboards we see today are using similar versions of that, but SwiftKey is just an example of it. Why do we mention these? Well, we have these two entrepreneurial companies with the idea to improve keyboard usage on mobile devices, both with similar valuations at the stage uh, a, a few years ago. Actually, I think they've started to diverge now with SwiftKey doing a lot better, but at Series B, it was about the same. And they had two different visions of how they were going to win the mobile keyboard market. So we've seen this a lot in this course. Uh, technological opportunity comes. Companies have the same basic idea that there is an opportunity out there and uh, there's a, a, a opportunity for innovating in particular. And uh, But they have different ways of approaching it. And that different ways goes all the way down. Uh, through all the four choices of entrepreneurial strategy. Uh, but it's what I want to focus on here is the choice of competition. Um, now, one thing we should note is these companies aren't alone. There are all these other ones uh, doing similar things, uh, various designs, all with the same goal in mind. Uh, the one down uh, in the bottom middle is uh, uh, the Minium keyboard. Uh, that was uh, a CDL venture, Worldscape. Uh, uh, noticed that they had a vision of being able to squeeze uh, predictive texts into a small space. You can try that out. That keyboard now, they've moved on to predicting emojis and other things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, they were a CDL company in their time. Uh, 
what have these companies done, Tactus and SwiftKey? Well, Tactus has gone for IP protection, has 15 issued patents, 45 pending at the time, a couple of years ago. They made the choice to go with intellectual property. Whereas SwiftKey has been focused on bringing their product to market, it's been in market, uh, with uh, three or more software generations over four years and significant follow-on innovation going on. So they haven't been worrying about all the patents and stuff. They're being, let's get to market, get to market quickly, experiments and learn. Now, as we know, with a lot of AI companies, especially ones that rely on uh, interacting with humans to gather the data needed, uh, this is a common uh, thing going on there. So SwiftKey have been doing that. Now, what is interesting is these companies, excuse me for a second, uh, are making actual choices of how they're going to appropriate the value of their innovations. What is appropriation? Appropriation is that an innovation is going to have certain value in the market and you're going to try and find means by which you can capture more of that value. That's what we call appropriation. So choosing how to appropriate, well, here's a great example. This is one of our favorite pictures. Uh, this guy down in the bottom left is, uh, is a favorite innovator. He, he has got a shotgun in his hand. He's walled off these trees. These are apple trees. And he's come up with uh, a better apple and does not want the seeds and other things falling into the wrong hands. So has erected a barrier. So that's how he's chosen to appropriate. appropriate. But of course, companies today choose to have intellectual property protection rather than this uh, physical thing that, uh, that he does here, but it, it's basically the same idea. Okay, so let's start to, uh, so that's just one example of this. Um, now, let me start with a puzzle of why would you do anything other if it was an option for you to build that big fence? In other words, to get intellectual property protection. Um, you know, for many years, uh, uh, and I admit I fell into this, is that startup companies would come to me. And the first question I would ask them was, what have you done to prevent imitation? Have you got formal intellectual property? Have you got a patent? How are you protecting this? And why would you, you know, there was a reason for that. Why would you ever choose... Why would you ever choose something other than trying to control who can profit from your innovation if you had the opportunity to do so? Okay, why wouldn't that be your first priority uh, in any of these things? Um, but I found that startups were persistently telling me something different. They were saying to me that they were not doing this and instead, they were focusing on execution. Now, for many years, I just dismissed this. I mean, you know, after all, don't you always want to execute well as well? You know, control, execution, why not do both? Now, of course, that is an issue. Um, because, as we know, startups have limited resources. And uh, it actually takes some resources to control. And it takes some resources to execute. And maybe they have to make a choice. In which case, why would you ever choose to execute whatever that means, okay? Well, after hearing this for a number of years, started to think more carefully about what that meant, that maybe there was an alternative to control. So let's take us back to these two companies. One, Tactus has chosen control IP protection. The other, SwiftKey has not, okay? SwiftKey has chosen to get their product to market and to continue, to continue to innovate such that they are the best keyboard for users. Okay, Now, that's a very different mode of... It's, it's not a mode of protecting your market. It's a mode of continually competing for it. Okay, Investing continually in renewing capabilities so that you are producing the best product you can. Now, from a perspective of investors... We know what to do with control. You value the IP and you say, once you've got the IP, it's like writing an annuity for the returns into the future. Whereas execution, that's different. Execution requires continually innovating. If we're going to 
value anything, it's like the team, the organization, and a whole lot of subjective things. That is a very, very hard thing to value. But nonetheless, companies choose that path all the time. And moreover, I can't sit there and tell you that it isn't a better way to go. There are some advantages to it. So where is in control, you erect barriers to entry to protect yourself from future competition. In execution, what you do is you just try to stay ahead of the pack. Control to erect those barriers takes a long time. Execution allows you to get to market quickly, which can be really important for resource constrained firms. So there is a trade off there. So how, let me delve into this just a little bit more. Let me give you some examples you can understand. Um, some people are more predisposed to execution. Okay, They'll hit key milestones more quickly, be less dependent on significant venture capital investment, and will face a higher level of imitative competition. That'll be par for the course. The long-term performance is going to depend on their ability to develop a stream of follow-on innovation and to build capabilities over time. They may get to a point where they've got a brand and some barriers to entry, but that is not the focus initially. Whereas control-oriented firms, well, they'll be slow to hit key milestones, will require much more upfront capital and face less competition. The long-term performance will be rest in the strength of their intellectual property or other protection that they have. So investing into these two things is different. Control focuses on long-term appropriability. It is part of the implementing and controlling the vision of the founder. And it's facilitating how you capture key partners. Whereas execution is focused on getting to the market quickly, it, taking advantage of feedback and experimentation that arises from that, and doing so at a lower cost. And so you have, you know, these two things. You know, control will look like you're going for a pattern or you're trying to be a first mover. Execution will look like you've got a superior product, lower costs and capabilities. Time to market will be slow for control, faster for execution. And the future returns will depend in control on the unique assets that you actually have control on, whereas the future returns from execution depends on unique capabilities. And I know what you're thinking, that these exist in companies today. You know, there's a reason why when you compare Microsoft and Apple, Apple seems to be undervalued by the market relative to its earnings. Well, part of that is because of this difficulty that the market has. Microsoft, they have assets, they got user base, they've got lock-in, things we understand. A Apple have capabilities, very hard to do. Apart from their previous stellar experience <laughs> generating income, which I guess you would think would be enough. People worry about people's criticism of Apple is you always have to, they always have to have the next big thing. If they don't do the next big thing, they're in trouble. And that's basically what executing is all about. Okay. Now, of course, these are established firms. So established firms tend to use both control and execution. So we can't just focus on one or the other. But you see the issue when it comes to startup firms. Okay. And some startup firms do quite well on the execution run. This is Marco Ament. He was one of the founders of Tumblr. And he, a few years ago, uh, set up an app called Instapaper. Uh, and uh, there's a podcast in the readings that you can listen to. But one of his favorite uh, lines from that was, you charge a small amount of money, and that's it, you're done. You don't need to go seek venture capital money. You don't need to sell out users' privacy. They're not even new users. They're their customers for the first time in a decade. It's great. My goal has never been to dominate the market. He says, my goal has just been to make a living. So this is something that startups do. You know, that's what competing on execution like. Let's make a good product, make sure it's the best product, and we don't have to dominate the whole market. Perfect legitimate exercise, and moreover, could be more actually more profitable than the race to the top. Um, uh, of course, this paper, uh, this uh, Insta paper recently were sold to another company, Beta Works, and, and Marco meant moved to other things. But nonetheless, it's interesting. Um, now, the second dimension that we need to talk about is with whom to compete. Um, do you collaborate or compete with established firms? Uh, that's a choice. You don't have to compete with them. Okay. Let's compare the body shop with Microsoft. Okay, the body shop chose to take on established firms, established cosmetic retailers in all their forms. Microsoft did deals with them, famously with IBM. Okay, 
okay? The game it's a leg up. Now, of course, once it got out of startup mode, it was doing something different, but its first job was not dealing with end customers, was in supplying an operating system to IBM. We even see this for the same idea. We saw collaboration with Peapod working with existing supermarkets and competition with WebVam working to displace existing uh, supermarkets. And there are benefits of each form. The benefits of collaboration include, well, you get partnerships and you reinforce uh, the value creation along an existing value chain. You leverage existing capabilities and access existing uh, customers rather than having to invest and duplicate things to build them from scratch. And, of course, you mute competitive pressure. Good for consumers, bad for firms trying to earn money. Obviously, monopoly is better co competition if you can have it. What are the benefits of competing? Well, you can go for a novel value chain, okay? Uh, do something new that, as we know of our S-curve relationships, is going to have uh, an additional, uh, may have some better trajectory. You can create new capabilities. You can serve new customers, okay? Uh, things that are being underserved by uh, existing value chains. And you can establish independent bargaining power so you're not beholden to other firms who might have power over you. Both of those, they're all benefits. You can choose one or the other, okay? These are choices that get made all the time. And depending on the firm and depending on what they're trying to do, one might be a better choice than another. So we have this choice, uh, essentially, of who, who do you compete with? And I, I phrase sometimes the, the execution and control as the idea of when do you compete? Uh, do you compete today for the market or tomorrow in the market? So control is very much competing now to capture the market in the future through patents, proprietary networks, and owning key resources. Execution is realizing you're going to still have to be competing tomorrow. You're not going to have any IP. You're going to have open platforms generally and develop capabilities. Okay, So those are the difference between control and execution. Whereas the other dimension is who do you compete with, current incumbents or other entrants effectively. Um, product market entry, stealth niche tactics, and developing assets. If you want to do all those things, all of the things that often you hear of the disruption playbook, and we'll talk a lot about that later, are things you come into to being there. Um, other entrants, you would use licensing or acquisition to develop partnerships. You uh, can be much quicker to scale. Okay, It's easier to do that if you're delving with current incumbents. Uh, and, of course, you get capabilities that are reinforcing those partnerships as well. And so that's the compete and cooperate. Now, these dimensions, control, execution, compete and cooperate, give us the compass. The compass is mapping these two directions as ways to go. This is not a two by two. This is a which direction do you want to take your firm. And depending on which ones you choose, you end up in one of four uh, you end up in one of four directions, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, okay? Uh, and it will turn out uh, that firms often orient themselves in this way. For instance, we take the idea of a few years ago, mobile taxi or limo services that were being used, and from the perspective of, say, 2011, uh, there were, like, lots of firms choosing to... Uh, uh, use the same idea. And at least initially, their strategies could be slotted into these uh, different boxes. So let's start with the uh, bottom uh, right-hand quadrant, Uber. Uber were choosing to compete, obviously, and they were focusing on an app that gave people a much better experience, execution. There was no lock-in. Uh, Lyft, uh, moving up to the top right-hand corner were confusing the key, but they were using sort of social things to sort of lock people in more. Again, maybe to less extent, but that's definitely what they'll try to do. If we pop right down to the bottom uh, left-hand corner, we get Halo. Halo, they were all about providing uh, an app and services for existing taxi and limo services, no one else, uh, to do effectively what Uber and Lyft were doing. And then we had Winston up the top there, which you wouldn't have heard of, but it's a Canadian company that was providing back-end services to run the mobile and taxi, uh, mobile taxi limo dispatch stuff for uh, existing cab companies. Okay, and the difference why uh, Winston was more in control is that I was trying to, you know, uh, be the sole provider there. Halo were just trying to be the best app for uh, taxi services. 
Okay. So we had these companies following those different strategies. All right. Now, these uh, all fall into this compass, and the compass, uh, we've been able to name the strategies involved in it, and then the strategies involved there. Now, I'm going to we're going to talk about each of these four strategies. This is just by way of uh, preface uh, uh, in the future. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I do encourage you to read the Foundations of Entrepreneurial Strategy uh, to read about these four strategies uh, because they tend to be a convenient way of describing what you're doing and also relating it to bits and pieces you read about elsewhere. For instance, if you want to know where the Lean Startup exists, it's in the disruption box. You always focus on compete and execution. Not much talk of patents with the Lean Startup move movement. Okay. If you want to see where Peter Tile uh, zero to one uh, exists, well, that tends to be in architecture and intellectual property. Okay. Wants a monopoly. Why? That's what you should be aiming for. All about control. So these are interesting things that come there and ways of looking at the literature. And um, I hope you'll see that actually this framing of it. While it is a sense of, uh, you know, we said the choices matter, we said that the four choices were the, ch the cho particular choices that matter, and the choices that matter together, well, that's where we get to this sort of organization, which is what we will deal with in future lectures.